The subject of today's session is admittedly one of the lesser known biblical holy days, maybe even the most unknown. It is a fast day that takes place this month, and it's not Yom Kippur. It is in fact a fast to which only one single verse in the Bible refers. Of course, as always, it is instructive for us to begin with the words of the Bible to provide us with something of a compass, a roadmap, to set us on our journey. The background for the verse that introduces this little-known holy day is an inquiry, an inquiry that is presented to the prophet Zechariah. We read of it in Zechariah chapter 7. We'll begin with the first three, three verses of the chapter. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of God came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month in Kislev, when Bethel, Sharezer, and Megan Melech and his men had sent to entreat the favor of God and to speak to the priests who were in the house of the God of hosts and to the prophets, saying, They have a question. Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years? So, of course, underlying the question is what obviously was an observance that had been maintained by the people. When we consider the significance of the fifth month, this is a date that is fraught with significance in the events of the destruction, as we will note shortly. And now that the temple has been rebuilt with the return of at least some of the exiles as a result of the proclamation of Cyrus, the Jews ask the priests and the prophets, this is question that is first and foremost being posed to the prophet Zechariah. Should I continue to observe the fast of the fifth month, to continue to weep as I have all these years of exile? And what follows eventually as the answer is perhaps a very apt illustration of the principle that when you ask something, you had better be careful because you may get more than you bargained for in the answer. And that seems to be the case here, because of course, in the question, there was reference made only to the fifth month, weeping in the fifth month. And yet, the answer includes another three dates together with it. We've noted this answer in the past, in chapter 8 of Zechariah, in verses 18 and 19, we read the answer to the aforementioned question. And the word of the God of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the God of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall become times of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts to the house of Judah and love the truth and the peace. So, of course, the inquiry was only about the fifth month. The prophet mentions four fasts. The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month. And of course, in context, there is the promise 
that while they were hitherto days of mourning, they will be, as a consequence of the rebuilding of the temple, days of happiness and rejoicing. So, of course, inevitably, we need to explore what the identities of these fast days are. Now, we have already addressed this subject, and I have to note that this is indeed the fourth session in Biblical Holy Days and their messages that explores the implications of this verse. Because we've already spoken of the fast of the fifth month, that is the most glaring. We've also spoken of the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the tenth month. It is the seventh month that still remains an enigma. Now, in exploring what these months signify, a good place to begin is with Jeremiah chapter 52. Because Jeremiah chapter 52, structurally, very similar to chapter 25 of the second book of Kings, which is the last chapter of the book of Kings, just as this chapter is indeed the last chapter of Jeremiah, provides us with chronicle of destruction. The final event in the calamitous end of Jerusalem, of the First Commonwealth, of the Holy Temple. And with respect to the particular months that were mentioned in the chronology of destruction, we read first of the 10th month. This is in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 4. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem, and encamped against it, and built a siege work against it round about. So the city was besieged. This is what took place in the 10th month, and in commemoration. The fast of the 10th month, as we discussed, is the fast of the 10th day of the 10th month, when the siege of Jerusalem began. We read two verses later, in verse 6, about the fourth month. And in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the famine was severe in the city, so that there was no bread for the people of the land. Then the city was breached. The walls of Jerusalem were breached in the fourth month. And finally, in the wake of the breaching of the walls, we read in verse 12, now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzar Adan, captain of the guard, who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of God and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and, and every great house he burned with fire. And Jerusalem is in ruins. That's what took place in the fifth month. Now, these three months, indeed, are the bases of days of mourning. Of course, the prophet Zechariah spoke of these fasts being transformed into days of happiness and rejoicing. As long as the temple was again standing, the rebuilt second temple, these days were observed as holidays, as days of rejoicing. Once the second temple was destroyed, these days 
reverted to their status as fast days. Of course, you'll note that tantalizingly, in this final chapter of Jeremiah, there was no reference to the seventh month. So, we might be wondering just what fast of the seventh month is there? And there is what, at first brush, might seem to be an obvious answer. That is, well, the seventh month, that's the month of the fast of Yom Kippur. The first place in the Torah where we read of the actual date of the Day of Atonement, date of Yom Kippur, it is in Leviticus chapter 16. And here we read in verse 29, this shall be a statute forever to you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. Afflicting your souls means fasting. And do no work at all, the homeborn or the stranger who sojourns among you. So there definitely is a fast in the seventh month. But no less definitely, we can state this is not the fast to which God referred in the prophetic words that were given to the prophet Zechariah. Why not? Well, first of all, remember that the message in God's words to Zechariah was that these days, these fast days, these days of mourning, will be transformed into days of happiness and rejoicing. Well, there is no way that Yom Kippur could possibly be transformed into a day of happiness and rejoicing. Because Yom Kippur is always a day of happiness and rejoicing. Returning to Leviticus chapter 16, the very next verse, verse 30, tells us, for on that day will he, God, forgive you, to cleanse you, that you may be purified from all your sins before God. Well, what could be a happier occasion than that? A day of forgiveness. True, Yom Kippur is a day of awe. We've discussed its identity in that regard in other contexts, but certainly it is never a day of mourning. It is a day of happiness. Always was, always will be. Of course, beyond that obvious observation, we appreciate clearly in the words of Zechariah, he's speaking of fast days that commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem, the burning of the Holy Temple, that are reverted to days of happiness and rejoicing now that the Second Temple is built and Jerusalem has been restored. Which obviously indicates that just as the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, and the fast of the tenth month have to do with the events of the destruction, so too the fast of the seventh month. But what took place in the seventh month? It's interesting that in the final chapter of Jeremiah, there is no answer, but in the final chapter of the book of Kings, there is. In the second book of Kings, in chapter 25, after we read of the events of the destruction, indeed of the massacre of the people in the wake of that destruction, chapter 25, verse 21, concludes, so Judah was carried away out of the land. Then we read in verse 22, and as for the people who remained in the land of Judah, in other words, evidently, they weren't all carried away. Those whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed 
Gedaliahu, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, over them. So Gedaliah is appointed as a vassal, a tributary, but nonetheless as a Jewish semi-sovereign over the people who remained in Judah. And in verse 23, we read of what seems like something of a renaissance, something of a consolidation. And when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, they came to Gedaliah to Mitzvah. Also, Ishmael, the son of Netanyah, and Yochanan, the son of Kareach, there's a list of the people involved in this list. We will have occasion shortly to consider the two additional personalities I just mentioned at greater length. Ishmael, son of Tanya, and Yochanan, son of Kareach. Remember those names. But for now, they come and present themselves to Gedaliah, and in verse 24 we read, and Gedaliah swore to them and to their men and said to them, fear not to be the servants of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians, dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. And we can start something over again, or maintain something that still continues to endure. Even after the destruction, something of a message of consolation. And then, in verse 25, it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Netanya, the son of Elishama, of the royal seed, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah, that he died. Together with the men of Judah and the Chaldeans who were with him of Mitzvah. By consequence, in verse 26, and all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and came to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Meaning, even after the city was burnt, after the temple was destroyed, even after so many of the Jews were carried away captive, there was still a presence that remained. There was, if you will, a glowing ember that continued to endure in Judah when Gedaliah was assassinated. That marked the end. Whoever had remained fled to Egypt and that was it, until the proclamation of Cyrus gave license to the Jews to return to the land, that the nation of Israel returns to the land of Israel. Until that time, the land was desolate, the land was devastated. So in addition to the fasts of the fourth, fifth, and tenth months, we also have the fast of the seventh month. The fast that commemorates this final decisive end of the Jewish presence, the presence of Israel in the land of Israel, following the destruction of the first temple. That is undoubtedly something of an answer to our question. What is the fast of the seventh month? But of course, we realize that it raises at least as many questions as it resolves. Because while the other fast days are commemorating events in 
the national destruction generally. This is a fast, given the date, that commemorates the assassination of the man, Gidal Yahu. Indeed, by tradition, we refer to this fast day as Som Gidal Yahu, the fast of Gidal Yahu. Well, why should we be commemorating for all these generations the death of one single solitary man? Sure, it had implications. The people afterward fled to Egypt. But why focus on this particular event as of such earth-shaking and enduring significance. I mean, after all, while undoubtedly Gedaliah was a righteous man and we should feel very sad when any righteous, any innocent person is unjustly put to death, you realize that in our long and sorry history, if we were to commemorate every date upon which a righteous man was unjustly put to death, we would never eat. And of course, one can't help but note that given that the assassination of Gidaliao happened roughly 2,500 years ago or so, even if Ishmael, son of Netanyahu, had not murdered him, most likely he wouldn't be alive anymore in any case. So why the ongoing remembrance? Why this ongoing fast? Again, the narrative in the Book of Kings is rather terse. It doesn't really give us much of an answer. But there is one other place in the Bible where this assassination is presented. And in this other instance, we get a good deal more elaboration with respect to the surrounding circumstances. That other place, ironically, given that in Jeremiah chapter 52, we didn't see any reference at all to Gidaliahu or the fast of the seventh month, is in Jeremiah. Just not in the last chapter of Jeremiah. To understand what messages emerged in the book of Jeremiah, I feel compelled to take a couple of steps backward and to consider in broader outline the events that led up to the final devastating destruction. Because, of course, inevitably, it's only by our understanding what these historical events were that we become equipped to understand what the messages from these events are now for us. Because, you know, in the final analysis, we're not doing this as a matter of mere historical interest. We're doing this in order to learn, to learn from the past, to guide us in the present, and enable us to reach a better future. So it is that in this vein, we begin our discussion in Jeremiah chapter 37, specifically with the beginning of the reign of the person who ended up being the last king of Judah in the first commonwealth before the destruction, King Tzidkiah. And what the prophet tells us regarding King Tzidkiah is interesting. 
and multifaceted. That is, beginning with the opening verse of Jeremiah chapter 37. And King Tzitiahu, the son of Yoshiahu, reigned instead of Chonyahu, the son of Yehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. That is, this was an appointment of a tributary by Nebuchadnezzar. And we go on to read, but neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land hearkened to the words of God, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. So, of course, on the one hand, this beginning of the description of Tzitiao is not great. We're speaking of someone who is explicitly described in the Bible as not heeding, not obeying the words of God that were given to him through God's faithful prophet, the prophet Jeremiah. And yet, in the following verse, in verse 3, we read, And Tzitiao the king sent Yirkukal, the son of Shalemna, and Tzvanyahu, son of Maasiyahu, the priest, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Pray for us to God our Lord. Now, let's consider the circumstance here. They weren't obeying what the prophet said in God's name. But they believed in not only that word of God, but in the status of Jeremiah as God's faithful prophet, that they come to Jeremiah under the king's orders to entreat the prophet to pray to God on their behalf, on behalf of Israel. Well, the king may not be the greatest, but this is a far cry from, for example, Tzidkiahu's brother, Yehoiakim, who, when he heard the words of the prophet Jeremiah that had been recorded in the scroll of destruction, cast the scroll into the fire and burnt it. This is someone who clearly respects the word of God, respects the prophet, just uh, has a problem. Still not listening to what the prophet says. And if anything, what I think emerges as the principal characteristic of this king is simply how weak he is. That is, when the nobility contrives to have Jeremiah killed, it is none other than the king who goes out of his way to have Jeremiah's life saved. We see this in chapter 38, verse 10. Then the king commanded Evan Melech the Cushite, saying, take from here 30 men with you and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the pit before he dies. Save his life. And by consequence, Jeremiah's life is saved from the nobles who are plotting his destruction. And what happens shortly afterward is fascinating exchange between king and prophet, beginning in Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 14. I realize that all of this may seem to be rather accessory in elucidating the message of Gedaliahu, but I think we'll see shortly why it is in fact so very relevant. In verse 14, then Tzidiyahu the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet to him into the third entry that is in the house of God. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. So the king solicits 
the guidance of the prophet. Now, initially, Jeremiah responds, if I declare it to you, you will surely put me to death. And if I give you counsel, you won't listen to me. So what's the purpose of my saying anything? So Sithiyahu, the king, swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, as God lives, who made us the soul, I will not put you to death, neither will I give you into the hand of those men that seek your life. And, you know, of course, if the king would have really been wicked to the ultimate degree, this should have had no effect at all on Jeremiah. He would have said, okay, so he's swearing. So he's lying. But evidently, King Tzidgyahu was a sincere enough fellow that Jeremiah knew if he's swearing in the name of God, he means it. And so indeed, we read in verse 17, then Jeremiah said to Tzidgyahu, thus says God, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will indeed go out the princes of the king of Babylon. In other words, if you surrender, then your soul will live, and this city will not be burned with fire, and you and your house will live. That's one alternative. Verse 18, but if you will not go out the princes of the king of Babylon, if you refuse to surrender, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape out of their hand. You have two possibilities here. One may indeed involve swallowing your pride and surrendering, but it will result in everything being saved. The other alternative utter, complete destruction. And Sidiao the king said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the men of Judah who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they torture me. So, nice idea, but I don't want to do it. And Jeremiah responds in verse 20, they shall not deliver you. Obey now the voice of God which I speak with you. So it will be well with you, and your soul will live. Don't worry, it's not going to happen. I'm telling you to surrender, this is the word of God. And if you do so, everything go, will go well with you, nothing bad will happen. Verse 21, but if you refuse to go out, this is the word that God has shown me. And there is a vivid, horrifying description of the utter destruction that awaits Tzitiao and his family and his house and Jerusalem and all of Judah if he refuses to surrender. Culminating the final words in verse 23, and you shall not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon. Babylon, and you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Well, we've seen the extent to which King Tzitkiyahu really believes in God, and not only believes in God, believes in God having sent Jeremiah as his faithful prophet. So, how does he respond to all of this? Verse 24, then Tzidkiyahu said to Jeremiah, let no man know of these words, and you shall not die. But if the princes hear that I have talked with you, and they come to you and say to you, tell us now what you have said to the king, hide it not from us, and we will not put you to death, and also what the king said to you, then you shall say to them, I presented my supplication before the king that he would not cause me to return to Yonathan's house to die there. In other words, Tell them you came to me to ask for improved prison conditions. 
In other words, in the end, the king doesn't listen. He doesn't listen. He doesn't even want anyone to know that he heard the prophetic words of Jeremiah telling him what would be. It boggles the mind. But there's a critically important message for us to glean from this. That while on the one hand, we might well think, and I think we would be justified in thinking, that the a faith that King Tzidkiyahu demonstrates in the Word of God, in Jeremiah as being the bearer of the Word of God, is to his great merit, because he's a great believer. It's not to his merit once he has chosen to ignore those words. On the contrary, it is in itself an indictment. Because if you do come so close, you do know about God. You do believe in God and in his prophet. You do solicit the guidance of the prophet in God's name. And then you ignore it? That is, of course, immeasurably worse than never having solicited that guidance from God in the first place. And indeed, what happens? Well, it comes, of course, as no surprise to us that what happens is exactly what God had foretold through his faithful prophet. That in chapter 39, we read about the siege, we read about the destruction, we read about the fulfillment of everything that the prophet had conveyed in God's name. And after all of that is over, we come to Jeremiah chapter 40. Here's where we get back to the subject of Gedal Yahu. In verse 5, Gedal Yahu is explicitly cited. This is in the context of the words that are given to Jeremiah by the captain of the guard of the king of Babylon, when he says to him, go back then, Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah and dwell with him among the people. And so, indeed, as we read at the end of verse 5, the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present and let Jeremiah go. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, to Mitzvah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. And much as we saw at the end of the Book of Kings, but with additional elaboration, we see that this appointment of Gedaliah heralded potentially a renaissance, a renaissance, a new beginning for the people who were left in the land. In verse 7, now when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Achikam, governor in the land, and had committed to him men and women and children, and of the poor of the land, of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. Then they came to Gedaliah to Mitzvah, and once again, there is indeed here as well explicit mention of Ishmael, the son of Netanyahu, and Yochanan, and Yonatan, the sons of Kareach, all of these people together. And just as we read in the Book of Kings, in verse 9, Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shalem, 
swore to them and to their men, saying, Fear not to serve the Chaldeans, serve the Babylonians, dwell in the land, and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. And as for me, says Gedaliah in verse 10, Behold, I will dwell at Mitzvah to stand before the Chaldeans who will come to us. But as for you, live your lives peacefully, gather wine and summer fruits and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. And indeed, we read further in verse 11, likewise, when all the men of Judah who were in Moab and among the children of Ammon and in Edom, all of the surrounding lands, that were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, then they all returned. They all returned out of the places unto which they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah. So it really was an extraordinary new renaissance in the land. That is, it was about to be. It could have been. It might have been. It wasn't. Now, in the more detailed narrative that we read here in the book of Jeremiah, we read that the plot by Ishmael, son of Netanyahu, was not entirely a surprise. And indeed, in verse 13, we read of a warning that was given to Gedaliah, that Yochanan, the son of Kareach, and all the captains of the forces that were in the countryside came to Gedaliah to the mitzvah and said to him, do you know that Baalis, the king of the children of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, the son of Netanyah, to slay you? That is, be warned. He's going to kill you. But Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, did not believe them. And Yochanan proposes a preemptive strike, and Gedaliah said to him, you shall not do this thing, for you speak falsely of Ishmael. Gedaliah, so righteous, so naive. Yochanan warned him, why should you let Ishmael slay you? That all Judah that are gathered to you should be scattered and the remnant of Judah should perish. What prescient warning expressed here in verse 15. Because, of course, that's what happened. At the beginning of chapter 41, we read of the dastardly deed. Beginning with verse 1, now it came to pass in the seventh month, the seventh month, that Ishmael, the son of Netanyahu, the son of Elishama, of the royal seed, and some of the chief officers of the king and ten men with him, came to Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, to Mitzpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mitzpah. Then Ishmael, the son of Netanyah, and the ten men that were with him arose and struck Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, with a sword and slew him. Just as Yochanan, the son of Kareach, had warned. And Ishmael slew all the men of Judah that were with him, that were with Gedaliah at Mitzvah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. And there is a Christly description of the carnage, the massacre, that he then continues to perpetrate against many, many more people, and in the consequent devastation after all of this carnage is over we read of 
how those who were left in chapter 41, verse 17, departed and dwelt in Gerut, Kimacham, which is by Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them. Because of Ishmael, the son of Netanyahu had slain Gedaliahu, the son of Achikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. But they didn't leave yet for Egypt. And what follows is a critical additional dimension that wasn't described at all in the book of Kings, but it's described here. At the beginning of chapter 42, we read, then all the captains of the forces and the Yochanan, the son of Kareach. Remember, he's the good guy who came to warn Gedaliahu that Ishmael, the son of Netanyahu, was going to kill him. So all of these people, from the least to the greatest, came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, let now our supplication be accepted before you and pray for us to God, your Lord, for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many as your eyes see us. That God your Lord may show us the way in which we may walk and the thing we may do. Which once again evinces the kind of righteous dedication we really want to hear God's word. Except you'll notice that there is one subtle and perhaps troubling motif in their entreaty to the prophet Jeremiah. How do they describe God? They don't say God, our Lord. They say God, your Lord. And indeed, from Jeremiah's response, it becomes very clear that he highlighted that flaw in their entreaty because the response in verse 4 then jeremiah the prophet said to them i have heard you behold i will pray to god your lord according to your words and it shall come to pass that whatever god shall answer you i will declare it to you i will keep nothing back from you then they said to Jeremiah, because evidently from Jeremiah's response, they gleaned that they didn't make a very convincing presentation of their sincerity. God shall be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not act according to all the things for which God, your Lord, shall send you to us. And although in that verse they refer to God again as God, your Lord, in the following verse, in verse 6, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of God, our Lord. They got the message. To whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of God, our Lord. They say it twice. That is, first, they stress that they're the ones who are soliciting the guidance. Second, of course, they fix up the poor choice of expressions from before, and now refer to God as our Lord. And finally, they pledge unswerving commitment to do whatever God says. Indeed, even to the extent that they call God, as it were, as witness to their sincerity, that God will be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not, according to all the things that God tells us to do. So they committed themselves. And 10 days later comes God's answer. 
it came to pass after 10 days that the word of God came to Jeremiah. In verse 8 now, that he called Yochanan the son of Kareach and all the captains of the forces who were with him and all the people from the least even to the greatest and he said to them, Thus says God, the Lord of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your supplication before him. These are the possibilities. A careful attention. This may, in its own way, sound sadly familiar. Verse 10, if you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down. And I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent of the evil that I have done to you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, says God. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies to you that he may have mercy upon you and let you return to your own land. That is possibility number one. And then, beginning in verse 13, we have possibility number two. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of God your Lord, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the shafar of the horn, nor have hunger for bread, and there will we dwell. Now, therefore, hear the word of God, you remnant of Judah. Thus says the God of hosts, the God of Israel. If indeed you set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, then, verse 16, it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared will overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine of which you were afraid will follow close after you there in Egypt. And there you shall die. And there is a vivid, extended description of the calamitous fate that will await these people, the remnant of Judah, if they choose to disobey God and to go to the land of Egypt. Two possibilities. One course leads to God saving you if you obey him and stay in the land of Israel. The other course, if you disobey, if you go to the land of Egypt, what awaits you is utter destruction. Culminating, I'm skipping to the last verse of chapter 42. Now, therefore, know certainly, if you choose to go to the land of Egypt, that you will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go and to sojourn. Well, you'd think this would be an obvious decision, wouldn't you? Remember, the people entreated Jeremiah to tell them what God said. They committed themselves to obeying whatever God told them. They even called God to be witness to their sincerity. And at the beginning of chapter 43, we read, it came to pass that when Jeremiah made an end of speaking to all the people, all the words of God, their Lord, for which God, their Lord, had sent him to them, all these words, then Azariah, the son of Hoshaya, and Yochanan, the son of Kareach, and all the proud men spoke, saying to Jeremiah, you speak falsely. falsely. Wasn't he just the faithful prophet of God? No, you speak falsely. God, our Lord, has not sent you to say, do not go to Egypt to sojourn there. You just heard the prophet speaking in the name of God. 
you believed him as the faithful prophet of God. What are you talking about? But they refuse to listen. They come up with some really ridiculous excuse. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, the attendant of Jeremiah, sets you on against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they may put us into Babylon. So they refuse to listen. So Yohanan, the son of Kareach, remember, he was the good guy. And all the captains of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of God to dwell in the land of Judah. But Yohanan, the son of Kareach, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations into which they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, men and women and children and the king's daughters, and every person that Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, together with Jeremiah the prophet, all of them, and he takes them all, and they came into the land of Egypt. For they did not obey the voice of God. And they came to Tachpanches in Egypt. And the word of God comes to Jeremiah in Tachpanches, in Egypt, warning the people once again of the consequences of their choices. He sets up, as it were, a foundation for the throne of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when he arrives, because he's coming. And they're not going to escape from the sword, and they're not going to escape from the famine, they're not going to escape from the pestilence, everything is going to pursue them to the land of Egypt. And moreover, he goes on, Prophet Jeremiah, to rebuke them further. This is in chapter 44. And I must admit that when you read the rebuke in chapter 44, you wonder, is he talking to the same people at all? Because here he speaks in particular of the tendency of these people the turning away of the people in their wickedness to burn incense to other gods, to engage in idolatry. These were the same people who just a little while ago had expressed their unswerving dedication and fidelity to God. And, of course, pathetically, the answer is yes. And not only does Jeremiah feel compelled to rebuke them over all of these things, but when one considers their response now, in Jeremiah chapter 44, in verses 15 and on, then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of God, we aren't listening. We won't hearken to you. But we will certainly do everything that we uttered with our mouths, namely, to burn incense to the queen of heaven. Idolatry to pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes. We did it in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. We're going to do it here in Egypt. And when one considers this astonishing progression, it simply seems to boggle the mind. What's going on here? Remember, these are the same people who just a short while ago after the tragic murder of Gedaliahu, expressed their unswerving fidelity to God. Just two chapters earlier, in chapter 42. 
They specifically entreat Jeremiah to tell us what God says we should do. And then they ignore the instruction, go down to Egypt, and the last thing we see, they are engaging in idolatry in Egypt. Wow. What a precipitous collapse of everything sacred, everything worthy, everything meritorious. And of course, inevitably, when we consider now, in retrospect, what we saw both with respect to King Tzitkiyahu and what we see with respect to these people, Yochanan ben Kareach, son of Kareach, and all those who were with him. We see an interesting, troubling phenomenon. People who seem genuinely to want to come close to God. Remember, Tzitkiyahu had sent his emissaries to Jeremiah to pray on their behalf. The people come to Jeremiah and beseech him and treat him to pray to God on their behalf and to tell them what to do. And all this striving for closeness to God. We have no reason to question its sincerity. It was genuine striving for closeness to God at the time. So all this striving that in the end led them nowhere. Because in the end, not only did they not live up to the mandates that God gave them, but on the contrary, one could say they exploited that closeness to emphasize just how spiritually bankrupt they chose to remain. All the coming close to God, all the fervent belief, all of the expressions of faith, not only provide no merit, they are themselves part of the indictment, maybe even the main part of the indictment. You were so close, you strove for that intimacy, but it was only a superficial veneer in the end because you didn't listen. Because real closeness to God, really striving to come close to God means becoming godly through obeying what God tells you. And if you're not obeying, if you're not becoming godly, all of the spirituality that represented a potentiality just further indicts the person. I had the opportunity and I cast it away. That's what happened to King Tzitiyahu, who may have been teetering on the brink of righteousness. The name Tzitiyahu ironically means righteous of God. But in the end, through his choices, he brought about his destruction and the destruction of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. And Yohanan, son of Kareach, who again, at the outset, appeared as one of the good guys, who is concerned with nothing more than protecting the Gedaliahu's life, saving him from Ishmael, the son of Netanyahu, saving him from that assassination plot that he recognized could exercise devastating effects on those who remain in Judah. And in the end, Nothing's left. All that sincerity. Where did it lead? It led nowhere. It led to not only falsely accusing Jeremiah of 
giving them lies, a false message from God because of the absurd accusation that his attendant, Baruch, was inciting him against them. But when they come to Egypt, they were already in a state of mind to declare without hesitation, unreservedly, what you tell us in the name of God, we aren't obeying. We won't listen. We're continuing to be idolaters here. And from that genuine striving towards closeness to God, they sink to the most abysmal depths. Now, let's consider, in light of these narratives, what the message of the fast of the seventh month is. Especially, one can't help but note, the fast of the seventh month that is placed in the calendar. We observe it on the third day of the month, immediately after Rosh Hashanah. The holy day that comes at the beginning of the month, the day of the blowing of the shofar, and just one week before Yom Kippur. The exact date of Gedalia's assassination is not explicitly stated. It may have actually been on Rosh Hashanah itself. But of course on Rosh Hashanah, on the holy day, we don't fast. So the fast is deferred until immediately after Rosh Hashanah. And consider then the message that this conveys. What is, from our perspective, the theme of Rosh Hashanah? We've discussed this in other sessions of Biblical Holy Days. It is a message of closeness to God. It's a message of harking back to the starting point when we and God were so intimately bonded. We feel that closeness, we sense that closeness, and it is in light of that closeness that the theme of Rosh Hashanah is, as it were, the coronation of God. We crown God as our sovereign, as our king. Striving for such tremendous closeness, the very next day, we are treated to a warning. The warning isn't a mandate of the Torah. No, the warning comes from the prophets. The prophets have to write. Because, evidently, we proved ourselves in need of this warning. This warning that when you strive to come close, you better make sure it's sincere. And the most critical parameter of that sincerity in the long run is, where is it leading you? What does it reflect? Because if that closeness is merely short-lived, if it is merely a veneer, if it is merely superficial, it is truly much, much worse than anything at all, even than no closeness at all. On that note, I'd like to conclude with the words of another prophet in a totally different context, the words that are particularly germane for our purposes. Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 13 and 14. And God said, since this people draw near. No, they've drawn near. Sounds good, doesn't it? And with their mouth and their lips, they honor me. Sounds even better. They're honoring God. They're honoring God with their mouth and their lips. But it's only with their mouths and their lips. But they have removed their heart far from me. And their reverence of me, their reverence of God, 
is as a commandment of men learned by rote. The action of automatons, their heart truly isn't there. Therefore, behold, I will smite this people wondrously and the wisdom of their wise men will perish and the understanding of their sages will be hidden. Therefore, I will smite this people wondrously because they did come close. They did draw near, but it was only external. It was only superficial. It wasn't real. It didn't lead to any real change within them. Because the real barometer of sincere closeness is, are you changed as a result? Have you really become more godly as a result? Are you more faithful in obeying the word of God as a result? If the answer to those questions is no, then all of the attempt to draw near is reckoned not only as not conferring merit, on the contrary, it is the indictment. So we have Rosh Hashanah, and we feel this closeness to God. And we have a week after Rosh Hashanah ends, before Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, again, of course, again, as we noted, is the fast of the seventh month, but a different fast of the seventh month. That's the day when we have the opportunity to really, really feel the closeness of God's providence and to experience God's forgiveness. If what? If we listen. If we are sincere when we draw near. If when we have that opportunity to come close, it isn't just external. It's internalized. It's not just with the mouth and the lips. It's with the heart. It's an orientation. It's an attitude, a striving to become godly and to express that godliness in action, in our deeds, signifying our faithfulness, our fidelity to God. If we do these things, then we will have learned the historical lesson of the story of Gedalyam. A lesson of such critical importance every day of the year, but especially now, especially when we have the opportunity to experience such intimacy with God, to feel such closeness, is it going to be real? Is it going to affect us? Because if it does, then that closeness becomes the basis for being able to feel all God's blessings. If it doesn't, it leads us on a very different course. A course of destruction, of devastation, as is indeed commemorated by the fast of Gidal Yahu. May we indeed learn the lesson, internalize the message that the story of Gidal Yahu and his contemporaries comes to teach us a lesson of sincerely drawing close, a lesson of truly being transformed, a lesson of really being affected when we draw close to God in becoming truly gotten, in becoming imbued with his spirit and expressing that in practice, in our faithfulness and fidelity to God's word and his will. When we do so, we make ourselves worthy of his blessings. God bless you.